that you're acquiring new skills and being more successful in your current job and finding a greater, bigger next job. That's that vision. Microsoft CEO is excited about buying LinkedIn, but is it worth $26 billion? And how can you enhance your job prospects? We're also in Panama for a real Pirates of the Caribbean story and the history of the modern tax haven. And did Led Zeppelin rip off another band? The stairway to heaven leads to a Los Angeles courthouse. A jury will hear the evidence and so will you. That's all ahead here on Money Talks. Now, it's one of the biggest deals in technology ever. Microsoft is buying the professional network, LinkedIn, for more than $26 billion. Now, LinkedIn is generally a place where people go when they're looking for work, and Microsoft Office is a tool they use to do their job. By marrying the two, Microsoft will have access to 433 million resumes in more than 200 countries. But is the hefty price tag worth it? Here's Microsoft CEO explaining the most important deal of his career. I'm a deep believer in productivity tools and communication tools because that's what empowers people to be able to be great at their job. But think about taking that and connecting it with the professional network uh, and really having that entirety of what is your professional life be enhanced, more empowered, more mm -hmm. where you're acquiring new skills and being more successful in your current job and finding a greater, bigger next job. That's that vision. Now, the acquisition of LinkedIn gives Microsoft access to a trove of personal information, which is key to the motivations behind the deal. Nearly two-thirds of LinkedIn's $3 billion in revenue comes from corporate recruiters looking for ideal job candidates. In other words, that's a very useful tool for HR departments. The service is free, but it makes money from its premium service, which requires a subscription. Now, with 70% of LinkedIn's users outside the United States, the information LinkedIn holds about potential employees globally can help Microsoft Outlook users do last-minute prep for meetings with people they may never have met before. Well, for more on this, we're joined live from London by Mariam Behmad, who's been following the story very closely for us. Uh, Mariam, Microsoft paid well over the odds, $26 billion. How did they come to that valuation? Well, for the most part, this is a big deal for Microsoft, and they knew that going into it. The software giant is really trying to make a comeback. This tie-up will give it the leverage it needs to tap into the largest networking site and, of course, shift to cloud networking, which is what it always wanted to do. We have to remember, even though LinkedIn doesn't have the household name of Facebook, a much larger social network, this is really the most widely used site for people to advertise professionally. So no matter what, it'll give Microsoft off the leverage to compete with the likes of Apple and Google, just to name a few. Mariam, a lot of our viewers will have LinkedIn profiles. Uh, how do you think their experience will change over the coming months and years? Mm. Well, it's, it's not meant to change that experience as much. Rather, it's supposed to make the software, for example, faster. You know, we have to remember this is really more a mass market opportunity for Microsoft. But of course, LinkedIn is expected to walk away with better access to that software development we need to see in advancements. You know, the core idea really is to draw on more data to boost productivity and make both LinkedIn and Microsoft more popular. So this deal can also make it top for, for, of course, Facebook to really muscle its way into that work-oriented social network. So I think that you'll find that users will like the fact that, the fact that perhaps we'll see faster uh, service and accessibility and smoother softer, or smoother software, for that matter. OK, Marion Behmard in London, thank you very much for the analysis. So how about your online CV? Earlier, we spoke to a recruitment expert, Dennis Pennell, and here's his advice. Well, you really have to be to be careful to really, you know, uh, put all, all information you can on, on your LinkedIn page, because also you have to be aware LinkedIn is more than a social network. It's also it has become, you know, the media. When you look at all the stories being uh, published and posted on, on a daily basis, it's also a nice way to uh, build community and to manage community. Of Therefore, I would also uh, advise people to join groups of interest reflecting their own interests. 
because this is a great way also to have a visibility and, and to be you know to be seen by by recruiter. And finally, again, yes, do not hesitate to post also on a very regular basis uh, stories on your own LinkedIn page. That's also a nice way to attract viewers and, and potential recruiters. Let's go around the world in 60 seconds for the top business headlines. Puerto Rico has moved a step closer to a messy default. That's after the U.S. Supreme Court refused to permit the U.S. territory to use an old debt restructuring law. Puerto Rico currently owes creditors over $70 billion. If it defaults, benefits and pensions would go unpaid and large numbers of government employees could lose their jobs. For the first time, Apple has announced it's opening three of its key features to third-party developers, Siri, Maps, and iMessage. That means that on its next operating system later in the year, apps like Uber could be accessed using Siri and other parts of the phone. Apple's move only brings it up to date, though, with rivals Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. And the U.S. Federal Reserve begins its two-day meeting on Tuesday to decide whether to raise or hold interest rates. Fed Chair Janet Yellen had previously pointed to a summer hike in rates, but recent disappointing jobs data could slow her plans down with rates likely to remain unchanged. Now, it was the deadliest mass shooting ever carried out in modern U.S. history. But while Sunday's attack on the Pulse gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, once again ignited debate over the country's gun laws, many others opted to exercise their right to bear arms. In the hours following the shooting, sales of firearms surged. Meanwhile, shares in gun makers also rose. Smith & Wesson gained as much as 11.5%, while Strum Ruger jumped almost 11%. It's not the first time a gun attack has resulted in a surge in sales. In 2012, Smith & Wesson saw a 48% increase in year-on-year -year sales after six people were shot dead at a Sikh temple in Wisconsin. The company also saw a rise of nearly 39% when 20 children and six adults were killed in Sandy Hook in Connecticut. So why the rise? Well, experts say shootings like this make buyers nervous about tougher gun laws being introduced. Now, all this week, our editor-at-large, Craig Capitas, has been digging into the world of offshore tax havens. We put Craig on the trail after the release of the so-called Panama Papers, the biggest leak of documents about the offshore business ever. Now, in Monday's report, he was in Miami talking to a former tax lawyer. He then flew to Portobello in the north of Panama to trace the history of tax havens, and he found it involved British royalty and shipwrecks. Here's his report. Panama means an abundance of fish. Before the offshore bankers came, that's what the locals would instinctively tell visitors. Now, thanks to 11.5 million leak records, the Central American country is the title of a shady story about money, power, and global greed. The story of the Panama Papers begins here in 1597. Plunder from Peru is brought to this town, Portobello. It's put aboard ships to go to Spain. But there was a fellow here called the Viceroy. He was the tax collector. And the tax collector wanted something called the Quinto. The Quinto was about one-fifth of all the booty that came through here. And what everyone in this town did was try to avoid paying the Quinto. The swashbuckling economics of Portobello is today enshrined by government statute. It's called Law 32 and allows foreigners to own and operate so-called anonymous societies. That became Panama's biggest appeal for those looking to hide their cash and the reason why they asked lawyers like Eric Kaplan for help. Many of them had issues with anonymity. Uh, it was not safe to be a wealthy person on a lot of South American countries so they were obliged to hide their wealth. Under U.S. investigation for decades, the principle of legal anonymity is likely to be hurt most as a result of the Panama Papers leak. These secret offshore accounts were held in the names of sham entities and foundations. And this conspiracy spanned decades. In the case of at least one wholly owned subsidiary, the practice of using sham entities to conceal funds began more than a century ago. 
And just like those pirates who sailed the open seas with unknown riches, a renewed push for financial transparency wants to put a stop to centuries of economic crimes, by boat and otherwise, heading to all kinds of exotic locations. Once the Spanish treasure galleons sailed past this point, their gold and silver were fair game for English crown freebooters. So, 741 nautical miles directly north of this watchtower, King George III created an offshore tax haven just for them. November 12th, 1788, really was a dark and stormy night. The Cordelia, the lead ship of a convoy of Jamaican merchantmen bound for England, struck a reef off Grand Cayman Island. Battling treacherous seas, the people of Grand Cayman paddled their canoes to rescue the drowning men. Everyone was saved, including a relative of King George III. As a reward for their heroism, the king decreed that his crown colony of Grand Cayman would forever be free of taxation. Though legitimate hideaways such as Luxembourg and the United States can rightfully lay claim to making more money out of humankind's insatiable yearning to avoid paying taxes, the roots of the $255 billion offshore industry remain firmly planted here in Portobello's 16th century tax office, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. TRT World's editor-at-large, Craig Kapitas, continues his travels tomorrow in part three of the Panama Paper Trail. We'll meet him in Panama City, where he'll explain how people make money from the shell companies they create in Panama. Now, plenty more coming up after the break on Money Talks. The Prime Minister of East Timor talks about his country's plans to strengthen democracy and boost its economy. A chef tells us France needs a new recipe for its labour laws. And did Led Zeppelin steal music? We'll hit the notes and a jury will decide.